Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm just going to get started because we have a, a full schedule tonight. So while everyone's trickling in, I'm going to just run through a quick intro. Um, we are Green Home NYC. Welcome to our opening forum of the year. I am Liza Chu, and I'm so excited to have you all join us tonight, along with my co-organizer, Andy Padian, whom you'll be hearing from later on. We are two uh, of the many very enthusiastic volunteers that help run Green Home NYC, and we have been around since 2002. Our sustainability nonprofit uh, has a mission to promote more sustainable built environment, and we do this through three main programs for the general public. Uh, the first one is Green Careers, and this group is focused on promoting green professional development and providing networking opportunities for graduating students or anyone who's interested in transitioning. We have the forums group, which is focused on presenting topics that are related to every aspect of a more sustainable built environment and lifestyle. And finally, we have the tours group, which provides opportunities for the general public to just have a closer look at many of the um, energy efficient buildings, sustainable businesses, and regenerative practices that we are very lucky to have access to in New York City. If anybody is interested in volunteering, you can scan a QR code that's up on your screen. We have a lot of volunteer opportunities in a variety of different areas, and we're always interested in having people join a community. Um, if you scan a QR code, you'll be taken to our volunteer form and we'll be able to reach out to you to help you find a fit for you within our organization. So for tonight, we are continuing with Green Home NYC's uh, tradition of kicking off our year of programming with our Green Catwalk. Uh, this is an opportunity for speakers to showcase some really exciting developments in the sustainability world through a series of a series of rapid fire presentations. This year, we're focused on the circular economy, which is a regenerative systemic approach to economic development. And it has been discussed by organizations from the World Economic Forum to the United Nations. And it's particularly relevant as we're focused on rebuilding in a post COVID world. So to set the stage, um, I like to quote from the circular economy handbook. And it says that the world's rate of consumption is at 1.75 times the earth's carrying capacity, which means that we are using 75% more natural resources than we are regenerating each year. At this rate of consumption, we really have no choice but to reconsider our habits, to look at our waste streams, and to look for creative opportunities in identifying where we can redefine them as resources. So in other words, we have to, uh, instead of spending money and energy mining for natural resources that is finite, we have to reconsider mining for manufactured resources that we may have existing already, probably in our trash. Uh, to get an idea of the waste of our, the state of waste in New York City, here is a very short uh, 1.5 minute video uh, from the New York City Department of Sanitation that was produced by Green Home NYC a few years ago. from the New York City Department of Sanitation. Uh, the New York City Department of Sanitation operates the world's largest municipal recycling program. So when I, people would ask me that my top 10 tips to green homes in New York City, the first four would be recycle, 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 and recycle. And that's because over half of your recyclable materials can, are ending up in the trash. That's over 600,000 tons in a year. Once you have recycling set up, some of the other things things I would look at would be reducing your waste, including uh, opting out of junk mail, catalogs, phone books, etc. 
uh, and buying durable goods to help reduce the amount of single-use items that you're throwing out in the trash. In addition, I'd look at reusing as much as possible, including donating materials uh, to nonprofits and other organizations that take these types of materials. I would also uh, take back materials to retailers and manufacturers for those items that can't easily be handled through your municipal recycling stream. I would also deal with your harmful household products by do dropping them off at upcoming safe events and permanent sites that the sanitation operates. And I would buy recycled materials as much as possible to help improve recycling markets and keep the entire system going. very cute. <laughs> so our seven speakers tonight will be walking us through the various ways that they're moving us towards a more efficient circular economy in the areas of food, water, fashion, and waste. And we hope that as you hear from them, you'll keep the seven, 10, and I've even seen 12 R's of zero waste in mind. Um, remember, respect, rethink, refuse, reduce, reuse, return, refill, restore, repair and purpose before we recycle. Our first speaker is going to be Lauren Sweeney, who is the co-founder and CMO of Deliver Zero. Hi everyone. Um, it's so nice to see so many faces tonight. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, so I am the co-founder and CMO of Deliver Zero. I have a presentation prepared. Um, but we're mostly just going to talk, right? I thought I'd, I'd give some visuals um, to help you um, see, see what our system looks like in real life. So oh, I'm sharing it instead of presenting it. I'm sorry. OK. So Deliver Zero started just over a year ago in Park Slope. Um, we launched with eight restaurants um, just in one neighborhood. because um, we, we had a hunch that um, other people like me and my co-founders, Adam and Byron, were really frustrated with uh, this conundrum we we're constantly faced with, which was that, you know, we're busy working parents, cooking isn't always on the table. Um, you know, we all like to cook every so often, but sometimes like I'm picking my daughter up from school and driving all over the place and taking the subway, it, it's chaos. Um, I have a five-year-old. Anyway, uh, my co-founders are, are both parents of young children as well, both very busy. And we felt like there had to be a more convenient way to order from the local restaurants that made our lives easier um, and more joyful. Um, without contributing to our city's waste problems. Um, so I've been happy in the last few months even to see that um, waste is being framed as more and more of a climate change problem. Um, but, and we'll get into more of this later, but since I started, <laughs> um, from the beginning, it's been really important for me personally to draw the link between climate change and waste. Um, part of the waste issue is that uh, manufacturing all of the single use containers that it takes to keep all of New Yorkers seamless habits going strong, uh, that in itself creates a lot of emissions, just manufacturing and shipping all of those single use containers. Um, but then what happens to them after they're used is even worse. They're either sent to a landfill or incinerated. Anything that's presented as compostable is typically not. Most of it contains a layer of PFAS. Um, if anyone is interested, there's, um, there was a study done by University of Oregon a few years ago that found that compostable packaging can be 18 times more, um, it creates 18 times more emissions than um, some of what's considered the worst types of packaging, like a single use plastic clamshell which is also bad and typically not fully recyclable. Um, so we created this solution, um, it works just like Seamless or Uber Eats with one difference, our orders come in reusable containers. Um, and sometimes when I say 
you know, it works just like these other platforms, people think, no, like it, there, there has to be a catch, right? It, it can't be as easy as ordering through Seamless, uh, but it is. Um, this is just the stat that I like to throw out there. And in my rambling, I, I didn't get into it. So New Yorkers throw away a billion takeout containers every year. And that study was actually from before the pandemic. And we know that uh, takeout has increased by 42% in the last year. So take that billion and, and multiply it by about 1.4. So, and maybe we've made a small dent in it, but we have a ways to go. Um, so how it works, you just search your address on our app or on our site and place an order. Really similar interface to those other platforms I keep mentioning. Um, your food arrives in reusable containers. It doesn't cost you anything extra. There's no deposit, there's no container fee. We don't charge the restaurants anything extra for these containers. We wanna make the sustainable choice an easy one. Um, so there's no charge as long as you return them within six weeks. And we give you two ways to do that. You can drop them off at any restaurant on our platform. So you can look at the map and see there's a place near a subway stop that you frequent. There's a place on your block. You just drop them off there. Or you can just hand them back to the courier the next time you order. So you can order sushi one time and then a few nights later order Thai food and just hand the containers back to the courier who delivers your food. So you don't have to return them to the same place. Um, and here's a couple of... Um, this food is um, from Sky Ice in Park Slope. If we, if we have any Park Slope folks on the call tonight, uh, they were one of our earliest restaurant partners um, and most enthusiastic. Um, the owners really care about promoting sustainability and they were, they're, they're just as frustrated um, as customers are with the amount of packaging waste that's created. Um, and this place um, is Bombay Grill and Curry um, in Greenpoint. Um, and the owner has, has two restaurants both on our platform. Um, so I, I'm not even coming up close on time, <laughs> so I'll, I'll go back. I, I started telling our story and then stopped. Um, I haven't spoken on a panel in a while, so I'm very out of practice. Um, so we launched in Park Slope eight years ago with eight restaurants. Within about a month, we were featured by the World Economic Forum. Um, the Park Slope community really rallied around us. Um, and we, um, we experienced some really exciting success early on. Um, and I, I don't take credit for that. Um, I think it's really our customers who made that happen for us and the people we connected with on Instagram who really supported us early on and, and helped us um, like amplify what we were doing so that we could grow uh, faster into other areas. Um, so after about like six weeks, we moved into Greenpoint and Williamsburg, um, where we were lucky to find restaurant owners who just got it and they were excited about it. Um, and they've been some of our best partners. Um, and then the pandemic happened, um, just as we were starting to think about launching in Manhattan. We had three restaurant partners ready to go there. Um, but then as, as our lives all turned upside down, um, I felt like I couldn't message that food delivery was safe or that even reuse was safe. Um, so rather than finding some marketing spin or some PR angle to, to make it work, like that, that is completely soulless for my opinion. So, so we, and my co-founders were on the same page. We got on a call one morning and we're like, we can't do this. We don't understand this virus. So we made the really difficult decision to go on pause. We had no idea how long it was gonna be for. This is back when we didn't, none of us understood that we'd be wearing masks a year later. It's strange to look back. Um, so we went on pause for three months. During those three months, we got ready to come back stronger than ever whenever that ended up being. Um, we, started evaluating the safety of reuse to make sure that um, if we came back, it would be safe. We started um, understanding both that it was safe for delivery people if proper precautions are taken. So I, I was personally most concerned about 
the delivery people actually handling, ha having to interact with so many people, I, my heart was breaking. Um, so we, we felt safe about that part and we felt safe about the safety of reuse. And Oceanic Global uh, was nice enough to include us in their guide to restaurant reopening. Um, so that was a great resource for um, affirming the safety of reuse during the pandemic. Um, and we, we do feel very strongly that we're not putting anyone at risk. We wouldn't have relaunched otherwise. Um, so when we relaunched, we came back in Manhattan with this very weak little offering of three restaurants in the East Village. And one of them was pickup only. Um, that was June 26th. And now we have about a hundred restaurant partners in Manhattan spread throughout the city. We have stronger coverage in some area, areas more than others, um, but it, it's been a really exciting chapter for us and we're really just getting started. We wanna have all of your favorites. Um, that's the main feedback I hear from customers is they want more restaurants and there are certain names I hear a lot. So <laughs> we're working on that. Um, just making it as easy for you to, to make the choice to order through us um, on those nights you don't feel like cooking, which, I mean, this is an audience of New Yorkers, right? So some of us have never turned our ovens on. Um, I can start taking questions. We're actually going to um, take- We're doing questions at the end. Okay. Um, if anyone wants to post your questions in the chat, um, Lauren and anyone, any of the speakers can actually directly address them. Otherwise, we're going to uh, read out all the questions at the end um, and have like a full Q&A session. Okay, so, cool. Thank you, Lauren. That's awesome. I see that a lot of people are excited to see Deliver Zero throughout New York City, and we hope that you'll expand and um, We'll see a 2021 that's filled with Deliver Zero everywhere. Yeah, next, I, I can say that next we're going to Chicago, LA, and Amsterdam. So, oh, wow, that's exciting. You guys really are putting that out fun. there. That's exciting for you guys. Um, so, thank you, Lauren. Next up, we're going to have Yami Yamu, who is the founder and director of Oko Urban Farms. Hi there, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> nice to have everyone join us today. Um, thanks to Green Home NYC for putting this together. It's really cool. Um, so I'm Yemi Amu. I am a farmer in New York City. I've been farming in New York now for, oh, at least a decade. Um, been working both as a farmer and an educator. Um, I started farming originally because I was working um, with a formerly homeless, mentally ill population and doing nutrition education, culinary education with them. And I realized that, you know, just getting access to healthy food options was actually um, more relevant than me necessarily um, cooking for them or telling them how, you know, uh, telling them to eat healthy, right? If you don't have access to healthy food options, then it doesn't matter even if you have the knowledge about healthy eating and cooking, if you can't get the food. Um, so I started farming at that point so that I could A, grow food for the residents um, and B, teach the residents how to grow food for themselves. This was at a supporting ho supportive housing facility. And then um, I started making the connection, of course, between um, feeding people and also the environmental impact of food production and feeding people. Uh, I was introduced to aquaponics, which is the type of farming that I do now. Oko Farms is an aquaponics farm in Brooklyn. And I was really um, attracted to the closed loop system of aquaponics. This is a system whereby um, you're raising both fish and vegetables together in water. I'm gonna play a little video that takes you a little bit into the science of it, but what attracted, to it, what attracted me to aquaponics was not necessarily the science of it, but the fact that the system itself is drawing on um, really this um, 
older, or should I say ancient integrated agricultural approach to food production. Um, we have this binary way of growing food right now where our older technologies really focused on um, biodiversity as a means for survival. Um, but the idea that in order to survive, in order to respond to environmental stress, such as flood or drought or um, any other environmental issues or stresses that can come up, the best way to survive is to build and foster um, biodiversity and to foster symbiotic ecosystems. And aquaponics really is rooted in that. Um, the way we practice it now, or most people do, is like super high tech and there's a lot of science involved, but really fundamentally, it is about fostering symbiosis and building ecosystems and understanding that um, we have to reduce waste or create less waste and actually regenerate the planet in the process of growing food. So just to go quickly into what it is and, and then I'll play the video is, it's just a system whereby you're raising both um, aquatic animals and plants together. Um, typically when people raise fish, that water is discarded. I think aquaculture in the United States uses about 9 billion gallons of water a day. Um, fish produce waste and all that water is discarded. Um, nature doesn't work that way. You know, seas and oceans don't empty, you know, the ocean doesn't empty out or rivers and lakes don't empty out because, you know, aquatic animals are in there and producing waste. Instead, what happens is that um, microorganisms and plants are introduced in, you know, in natural bodies of water. There are tons of aquatic plants that you'll see. There are also billions of communities of microbes. And what those guys do is convert all of that fish waste into, um, well, the microbes convert the fish waste into nutrients, which the plants take up, and then the water is clean for the fish. So that's what we do. We literally, use waste to grow food so that we can feed people. So I'm gonna just play, and this, this is a system that is thousands of years old. Um, it was practiced in, um, in Mexico, Mexico City, especially by the Aztecs, um, using a system known as chinampas. It was practiced in, in China, in um, South America, and other parts of the world. We have a more, modern approach to it, but it's the same everywhere. I'm gonna share my screen, play this video, and then I can show you some photos. And promote aquaponics as is, is an aquaponics production, education, and design build company in Brooklyn, New York. Our mission is to practice and promote aquaponics as a sustainable farming method. Sorry. Oko Farms is an aquaponics production, education, and design build company in Brooklyn, New York. Our mission is to practice and promote aquaponics as a sustainable farming method and to spread the knowledge and skills to practice aquaponics to people of all racial and socioeconomic backgrounds. We operate NYC's first and only outdoor aquaponics farm that is accessible to the public. Our current farm is located in Bushwick, Brooklyn, on a formerly vacant lot. On the farm, we grow a wide variety of vegetables and herbs, along with a diverse range of freshwater fish. The farm was created in 2013 with a very little budget and a lot of creativity. We used a lot of recycled lumber and other donated materials. It was important to demonstrate that anyone can grow using aquaponics regardless of their budget. So what is aquaponics? Aquaponics is farming and water. It is the cultivation of fish and plants together in a symbiotic aquatic ecosystem whereby fish waste provides nutrients for plants while plant roots filter the water for the fish.
This farming method allows you to raise both fish and plants while using 80% less water than traditional farming. Over the years, we have cultivated a wide variety of crops, including grains like rice, millet, and sorghum, along with leafy greens, medicinal herbs, flowers, and fruits. We also raise a wide variety of freshwater fish, including ornamental fish like goldfish and koi, as well as edible fish, including tilapia, bluegill, channel catfish, freshwater prawns, and mirror carp. Aquaponics is also scalable and can occur both indoors and outdoors. Stop there, um, just to be mindful of time. Um, so again, we save water and growing food because we're recycling water. We actually happen to be on a lot with no access to water. Um, the nearest water access is about a block away um, and it's a fire hydrant. So we are dependent on um, rainwater for the most part to run our system. We've been on our current site for about seven years. Um, and other soil farmers had actually been invited into the space and it didn't work for them because there was no water access. It was perfect for us to demonstrate um, this growing system where you're saving water and you're able to grow both fish and plants at the same time. Um, and again, you're, you're recycling fish waste to grow food. We are working on, we're actually expanding. We are going to have our second site um, this year, which we're really excited about. This was supposed to happen last year, but because of COVID, our plans were delayed. We do a lot of education on our farm. We have people literally from around the world um, who come to us to see aquaponics for the first time because we're outdoors and we're accessible. We also teach people from around the world. We partner with organizations, um, both in the United States and overseas to help bring aquaponics to their community so that um, they can feed people. We are very much about giving people the tools to feed themselves, but also making sure that we are grounding it in um, regenerative agriculture and making sure that the way that we produce food um, is a, a response to climate change or will protect us from the impact of climate change and also will not further create damage um, to the environment. I just wanted to show you real quick because I think it's so cool, some of these um, systems. So here is um, the Chinese, you know, the Chinese are the first recorded people, actually, the, the earliest records of aquaculture come from China. And it really was about integrating um, fish cultivation and plants. You see here, you have fish down here, and then you have um, plants growing on top. And that fish waste was able to um, not just provide nutrients for the plants, but also that water was the source of irrigation. Here is another one over here. Um, this is a more modern application or more relatable one for a lot of people around the world is rice farming. Rice grows um, on, you know, in shallow ponds. There are people who flood fields, which is extremely wasteful, but this is how rice is typically um, cultivated in ponds with fish at the bottom. Um, this is from ancient Egypt. This is what it looked like in Mexico with the Chinampas. Um, the Chinampas still exists today. So this is um, in Hawaii with taro farming, um, with taro growing directly in ponds. So yeah, this is, um, and, and we, because we want to make this form of system accessible to people around the world, whether it's people who are looking to feed their communities um, because of drought, because of limited access to land, we really focus on making sure that we make, um, that the techniques we provide folks are accessible, the language we use is accessible, um, the materials are recycled and accessible. We built our farm 
mostly with recycled materials and we encourage people um, to do that. If you wanna find out more, um, you can go to our website at ocofarms.org to see, um, to learn more about what we do. I think I'm gonna stop there because I have no idea how much time I've taken. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. I, I didn't want to interrupt, but yes, we're trying to um, power through all these uh, presentations. That was great and all the images were wonderful. Um, next up, we are going to hear from Lindsay Boylan, who is actually running for Manhattan uh, Borough President. And she's gonna be speaking on wastewater treatment. And I believe Thanks. I'm going to be sharing slides. Yes, thank you so much, Liza. I'll do my best to indicate when to flip it, if that's okay. I am, yes. I've gotten far enough in this world and yet I'm still technologically not advantaged. So I appreciate, I appreciate the help. You um, are not alone. <laughs> uh, so I'll tell you just a little bit about myself and why I'm interested in this conversation. And I'm, I'm loving listening. Uh, I have spent my whole career in urban planning in some way, shape or form. And, you know, conversations around the circular economy, around um, the way that we improve our cities, how they work, uh, it, are really important to me. My first decade in New York, I spent uh, managing public spaces and public parks. Uh, and our first uh, speaker tonight uh, talked a lot about the trash we create. And boy, you better believe the HBO Film Festival at Bryant Park creates a ton of trash on Monday nights. It was completely eye-opening to me. Uh, you know, after spending a decade in public parks management, I went into municipal finance and then ultimately worked for the state of New York as uh, the economic development and housing secretary. So this is my great love. Um, and my inspiration to go into this field was largely related to climate disasters and how we kind of respond to those. And so we're on our first light. We'll stay there for a second, Liza. Wastewater treatment, I think just to bring it, you know, a little bit closer to home, you know, we're probably all familiar with the Black Death, also known as the bubonic plague, took place in the 14th century, a highly contagious disease that spread over the majority of Europe and Asia, responsible for 75 to 200 million deaths in total. Uh, you know, a lot of the challenges that perpetuated the spread of this, uh, you know, terrible virus had to do with the way that cities were run. Um, human feces and urine, urine were contained in buckets. Once the bucket was full, the occupant of the cell or the house would throw the feces into the street, um, you know, ultimately producing almost 200 million deaths in, in the 14th century. Uh, but we didn't learn our lesson um, across the globe soon enough. Uh, in 1832, another deadly pandemic ripped across, especially Paris, the cholera pandemic. Um, you know, in the course of six months, you know, almost 20,000 deaths, uh, you know, people, people died and it caused a real moment um, to reshape and rethink how cities, especially Paris, were laid out. Streets got wider, um, you know, parkway systems got uh, more significant. Uh, the big urban planner responsible in Paris was Ausman, if you're familiar with Baron Ausman, and uh, that shaped a lot of how European cities and ultimately American cities were, were, were put forth. Now let's get to the really exciting stuff that's the context and how it relates to where we are today. Let's go to the next slide. And Vivian? Vivian? One back. Thank you. So my daughter really wanted to be here. Yeah, one more. Thank you, Liza. When I showed the poop emoji, she was very excited. <laughs> so that's her. Okay, now you can go back. <laughs> so what we're here to talk about is poop. It's a really serious thing. Go back one, Liza, I'm so sorry. Just stay on the poop emoji for just a second if you can. Um, you know, poop is really serious. The stuff I told you about just a second ago um, caused a lot of deaths. And um, as a result, urban planning was reshaped forever. But we continue to need to think about poop, think about crap, shit, whatever you want to call it. Not poop exactly, but wastewater treatment more broadly. What do we do with the sewage and uh, how do we make it more sustainable and more circular? Because that's the point of our conversation, right? The circular economy. Okay, now on to the next slide. We can move away from the poop emoji. <laughs> So let's let's get to some specifics because I'm a you know in the field of urban planning I'm a New York City you know politician I, I hate to use that term because some people don't like politicians but I'm in New York City politics uh, let's look at a map uh, you know I'm in Manhattan 
let's look at, you know, where our wastewater treatment plants are in Manhattan. We got two of them. You see at the top of that chart, we got, um, you see the name here, Wards Island and North River. You know what the interesting thing about that is? Uh, you know, they're both all the way on top of Manhattan. None near predominantly white, predominantly wealthy areas. That means it's a, it's a real reflection of how urban planning has worked writ large uh, in this country. Uh, we make the inconvenience, we create the problems, we create the things that we don't wanna see or deal with in low income communities and predominantly communities of color. And I, and I view the great challenge of urban planning now and in the future is to respond to climate justice, inequality, and systemic racism. So I think it's just really important to know who bears the brunt of responsibility in waste, waste, uh, waste management um, and what it means ultimately when you have waste management on site and not, let's say the most advanced version of that is you have worse air quality uh, in those areas. You have, it stinks more than others. If you've been on the West Side Highway, uh, in Upper Manhattan, you sense a smell, and that's because of the uh, the waste management wastewater treatment site. Um, it means poor water quality. Unless we put effort and money and thought into making waste treatment more efficient, we continue to hurt certain communities for the benefit of a whole. In addition to creating all these negative externalities around the environment and stuff that we have to act on, which you know from the two previous speakers. Okay, now we can go to the next slide. I have an exciting, boy, isn't that beautiful? I'd love to just give you a little snippet. This is so beautiful. You've probably seen it if you're a New Yorker. It happens to be uh, the city's hottest Valentine's Day spot just before the pandemic. It also happens to be New York's largest sewage plant. Uh, really exciting news. Uh, it, it's so popular in terms of people's love of it and how it looks. Uh, a Valentine's Day tour before the pandemic took just 16 minutes to sell out online. Uh, it's rarely open for tours, um, you know, and and when it is, it's it's a must see. And it's beautiful, I gotta say, whenever my family drives, you know, is in a cab or something past it and we see it going, um, leaving Manhattan, gosh, isn't that gorgeous? It's also incredibly efficient. Um, the new Town Creek wastewater treatment plant is a beautiful thing. Uh, you know, let me tell you a little bit about what you're seeing. Uh, there are digester eggs. That's what those beautiful cones are called. They're really gorgeous, aren't they? Wouldn't you want to have like a Christmas ornament on your tree that was a digester egg? I would. You know, what do we know about it? Um, it's the largest of 14 wastewater treatment plants in the city of New York. Those digester eggs handle 1.4 million gallons of sludge and food waste daily from across Brooklyn and much of Manhattan. Sludge means what you think it does. It means poop if you've had a bad week or ate something foul. You know, it means um, a little bit different version of that. <laughs> um, it means what you think it does. So this is a Let's just hold on this thought for a second. Uh, the Newtown Creek wastewater treatment plant as a great example because it doesn't just bring in the waste, uh, wastewater, waste for treatment in the wastewater plant. It actually does a lot more. It doesn't just flare and vent into the environment bad stuff like methane, which we'll get into a little bit later, not too specific, but it also powers homes in the area, 5,000 homes. They reuse the sludge and the crap and the and the poop, whatever you want to call it, they treat it, which I'll get into in just a second, and make it power for 5,000 homes in New York City. And now you can go to the last slide, Liza. Thank you so much. It's a different version of the circular economy. I mean, not even a different version, but kind of just a different pictorial description of the circular economy um, that Yemi was talking about. It's, you know, how do how does our current society with the amount of crap, literal and figurative that we create, um, turn it into something else. So, you know, in these plants, water gets treated, cleansed and released and, you know, released. Uh, you know, if it's doing it well, it, it goes through the system and becomes part of your, you know, drinking water yet again. Um, you know, once the water is clean, all done there. Uh, but sludge, you know, once it's been processed, it can become fertilizer. 
Um, the key here is breaking it down first with anaerobic digestion by bacteria. <laughs> and uh, that's the really exciting part, which I mentioned just above. Um, methane is what happens at these sites. It's, it's what um, you know, was talked about in AOC's description of the Green New Deal and um, cow farts and the like, and you know, everyone laughed about it, but it's a really big problem. Methane is 80 times as bad for the climate as carbon if released directly into the atmosphere. But it's a natural gas, which is significantly cleaner than coal. And there's nothing we can do to stop waste from turning into methane. That's the cows. In an effort to reuse and reduce, we can capture that methane, which is a great source of energy, and burn, you know, and, and when burned into it becomes carbon dioxide. So it's a great thing if we know how to treat it and use it and redirect that energy. Uh, so this is a really great thing. Um, we should be changing and investing in our waste management system in the city of New York and more broadly across the country and across the world to um, capture methane and redirect its use to actually power, power energy for homes. We can do this right now. We have a bad outcome we can turn it into a positive one with, with investment. And the whole purpose of waste management treatment um, goes back to what we started with, um, public health. Uh, how do we invest um, public finance money uh, with our knowledge in civil engineering to create better outcomes for society? And now we have to uh, turn those outcomes not just to public health, but to the health of our planet. And so I'm going to start when I become borough president, uh, pushing for that uh, effort with our two uh, wastewater treatment plants in Manhattan, and also responding to climate justice and um, the way that we've built urban planning, not responding to low income communities of predominantly people of color. And I'm really excited to be here. And thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Liza. Thank you. Um, I don't mean to rush everyone, but I'm going to just remind everyone, I'm gonna pop up this little <laughs> this little notepad just to let everyone know to wrap up in the next one or two minutes. Um, and we'll have plenty of time afterwards to have Q&A. And then if everyone wants to stick around, we will uh, keep the meeting open. So our next speaker actually is um, Renee Crowley, who is going to be speaking on composting and electronics recycling. She is the Deputy Director of the Lower East Side Ecology Center. Hey, Renee. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Which is always, uh, <laughs> I think I'm doing it. All right. So hi everyone, thanks for joining. It's been an exciting night and I am thrilled to be following the wastewater treatment talk, another favorite topic of mine. Um, but I wanna introduce you to the Lower East Side Ecology Center. We're a community-based nonprofit based on the Lower East Side. Uh, we've been operating since 1987 and our primary programs focus around compost collection and the processing of those food scraps in a very local environment. Our food scraps usually travel no more than about like five miles from where they're originally collected. And the finished compost that's created at the end of the composting process is then used on green spaces in the communities where those scraps were located. So great little closed dish loop of um, recycling materials in a community. A lot of that finished compost is also used in our stewardship activities um, in East River Park in the Lower East Side. Um, and a lot of our environmental education programs um, focus on composting, but also goes beyond just composting and uh, focuses on our connection to urban ecology and the local estuaries as well. And last but not least, um, we run uh, an electronic waste recycling program, which at first you might think like compost, ecology, gardening, all these connections to like green spaces. Why is this organization kind of uh, running a program based on technology? Um, I'll get to that in a little bit more detail, but basically thinking of the, the con contamination and the toxins that are in e-waste and anything that we throw out and how it impacts the, the health of our local environment. Um, so as said, um, I am focusing primarily tonight just on our composting and our e-waste programs. And um, so just starting out with compost, 
for those that are unfamiliar with the composting process, basically we take your food scraps, your yard waste, your leaves, um, wood chips, wood shavings, any kind of materials that were once alive and we build a compost pile and it's through that um, uh, decomposition process managed by humans that we create this finished compost. Um, a lot of community composting models like ours uh, focus on a very closed loop model of thinking of the using food scraps to create finished compost and that finished compost being used to grow more food that you eat and just kind of keeping everything in a, a local closed loop model. So there's a lot of amazing community composting groups across the country, across the world that really focus on this like closed loop nature of composting food waste. Um, but why compost? Why is composting so important? Um, one thing that I point out to folks is that food scraps generate methane when they end up in a landfill. Um, methane is a much more potent gas than even carbon dioxide. And so keeping those food scraps out of landfill is a huge priority with regard to climate change and greenhouse gas creation. Um, finished compost, the end product at the end of the composting process, builds healthy soils. And um, healthy soils have an incredible ripple effect through our ecology. Uh, healthy soils support healthy plants, stronger trees uh, that address our tree canopy related to urban heat island effect. Uh, healthy soils can help us grow healthy food, which have more nutrients in them, can help our internal health. Um, healthy soils can uh, help support um, advanced green infrastructure. Uh, being able to retain more storm water as we face storm surges in the future. Um, and one of the my favorite things to tell folks is that healthy soils actually sequester excess carbon from the atmosphere as a result of climate change impacts. So if you think about food scraps in a landfill generating methane contributing to climate change, but compost, uh, uh, finished compost being used to create healthy soils actually reverses the impacts of climate change. So great no brainer of what you should be doing with your food scraps. Um, and last but not least, composting create, actually creates more jobs than landfill operations. So thinking of the role that composting and composting programs play in a larger economical scale is super beneficial as well. So composting is awesome, right? So how do you do it in New York City? Um, what might be easiest to most folks in New York right now is to compost your food scraps at a local food scrap drop off site. This is a map that's up on the Department of Sanitation's website that locates um, all of the opportunities throughout the city where you can drop off your food scraps. Some of these um, are operated by groups like us and other um, drop off sites are operated more on a volunteer basis. So I encourage you to click the dot on the map and read the details about who the site is and what materials they accept. Um, for the most part, none of these sites accept like meats, cheeses, and oily prepared foods, mostly just your fruit and vegetable scraps, coffee grounds, and the like. Um, if you're feeling a little bit more ambitious and you have an outdoor space, you can compost in your backyard or at a community garden using such things as like a tumbler or um, compost, like wooden compost bins with wire frames. Um, this is for someone who wants to be a little bit more hands-on and who's really interested in generating finished compost on their own. Um, and then for all of those apartment dwellers who still want to have a very active role in their production of compost, um, you can compost in your apartment with an indoor worm bin. Um, this is a great activity if you've got kids or you're just a super excited adult who loves having worms around. Um, if you want to learn more about either composting at home or composting with a worm bin, we have some guides available um, that we can share with you too. So follow up with me if you want any information on that, because I'm going very quickly through all this because we got a lot to cover. Um, so that's composting. I'm going to switch gears to the e-waste program. Um, I first want to start off with just kind of pointing out the difference between electronics and household appliances because it seems to trip a lot of people up. Um, so electronics, you, I always think of them as something with like a computer component. 
um, something with like a semiconductor, whereas household appliances are more just like things made of metal, glass, plastic. Um, unless you have a super fancy computer toaster, which that would probably be more an electronic. Um, but why do we care about recycling our electronics? So like I mentioned, e-waste is incredibly toxic to our environment. Throwing it away in the regular trash um, contributes heavy metals to our uh, groundwater, our soils, our air. Um, and according to the EPA, 70% of the toxins that are found in landfills come from e-waste, but only 1% of landfill volume is e-waste. So you, that just kind of demonstrates the extreme uh, concentrated toxicity that is present in our electronic waste. Um, it's also illegal to put electronics on the curb, so you'll get a fine from the city, so that's a great reason to recycle. Um, you can think about reusing electronics, um, and also by recycling your electronics, you're reducing the demand for the mining of heavy metals, um, because when electronics are recycled, the heavy metals and materials are then repurposed and used in future materials. Um, so what can you do in New York with your electronics? Um, reuse, give it to a friend or family member who needs a outdated piece of electronics. You can donate, uh, you can sell. Um, I really, I think the repair market should, should be a little stronger these days. Um, thinking of ways for you to repair any broken electronics that you have. Um, oh, where'd it go? Oh, there it is. Well, yeah, you can recycle at a big box store, um, such as Best Buy, Home Depot. All of these more um, corporate groups have different policies about what they accept. Um, so check with them first. Um, and then last but not least, you can attend one of our electronic waste events. Um, we are hosting events seasonally throughout the city. So keep an eye out for when an event might be coming to your community. So just to kind of tie it together, the work that we do at the Ecology Center um, focuses on creative ways to use uh, items in our waste stream um, and repurpose them to create a, a super clean environment um, and support healthy ecology. So if you wanna learn more, we've got amazing volunteer opportunities. We send out a weekly newsletter with volunteer opportunities. And I think the best way to learn more about things like composting in your local environment is to really get a hands-on view of uh, what's going on. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks, Renee. Um, jumping right into it. Next up, we have Jessica Schreiber, who is the founder and CEO of Fab Scrap. Go right ahead, Jessica. Great. Um, I'm just going to pull this up. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, thanks for having me and good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Jessica, the founder and CEO of Fab Scrap, we are a five-year-old nonprofit. Um, we have a warehouse in Brooklyn and a shop in Manhattan, and we work with textile waste. Um, prior to starting Fab Scrap, I worked at New York City's Department of Sanitation. It was overseeing the city's clothing recycling program, Refashion NYC, which, quick plug for that, um, puts free donation bins in your basement or laundry room, and then they work with Housing Works and Goodwill to collect all of the donations. So that was mostly residential or post-consumer. That was clothing or household items that have been donated or discarded by a family or individual. What Fab Scrap is set up to address is the pre-consumer textile waste in the city, what's coming from businesses or companies. Um, it's every part of the um, design waste that happens before point of sale. So um, I'll go through with some examples of what that is. Um, and it's kind of, unless you're working in the industry, a little bit hidden. I think we're all very familiar with the amount of clothing that gets thrown away once it's used. Um, but for every pound of waste that we create as a consumer, the business creates 40 pounds of waste upstream, um, which technically means uh, businesses have 40 times more waste than what we throw away as individuals. So as an example of some of the textile waste that businesses are throwing away, um, fabric swatches. So mills are designing fabrics and they're sending all of these swatches to designers so they can choose fabrics for the season. 
Um, Mock-up and mutilated garments, you can see this is still um, having some notes and there's some rips in it. So not a finished sample, not something that could be sold or used. Um, cuttings from production. When you cut out a pattern, there's all those cookie cutter edges on the side. Um, that's just paper and small strips, but recyclable. Dead stock and excess materials. Sometimes um, brands have to buy more they can more than they can use to get the fabric that they want because of mill purchase minimums. So they're left with leftover fabric. Um, and then always extra trims, cones of yarn, leather skins. Um, best estimate that we could find is that. 12% of the total fabric waste that happens from start of um, a fabric to its end of life as a garment, 12% gets wasted in the design process. Um, and that is where fab scrap is working. So we work primarily with companies, um, but also home sewers, costume designers, interior designers, um, and we are collecting excess fabric scraps. Um, this is actually now closer to 500. We're working with 500 fashion and interior design companies, some for entertainment companies, um, for Broadway, TV, movies, and we pick up fabric um, in these bags or in rolls. And then we sort all of the incoming fabric with volunteer help at our warehouse at the Brooklyn Army Terminal in Bay Ridge. Volunteers sign up for a three hour session they're helping us sort the fabric for reuse or for recycling. And as a thank you, volunteers get to take home five pounds of fabric for free. So it's a really great thing for somebody who's just starting in the fashion industry. You get to learn a lot about fabrics. You get some trend forecasting because you're seeing what New York City designers are throwing away and you learn a lot about fabric in the process. Plus you leave with some new material to work with. Um, so at the beginning, Beginning of 2020, we had just passed half a million pounds. We're closer to 600,000 now, even through the pandemic. Um, small pieces get shredded and become insulation, carpet padding, mattress stuffing, and then we try and reuse as much as possible. So this is sort of what our circular version of this looks like. We're picking up from brands. We're consolidating that material and tracking everything. Um, data and transparency is really important to what we're doing. And then we have a whole community of volunteers that's helping us sort um, for landfill, for recycling or downcycling. And then we have our shop where we're able to redistribute and resell fabric. Hopefully it's upcycled and maybe even a supply for a brand that then also uses our service. And so eventually we're able to keep a lot of material uh, in cycle and extend the life of those fibers. Um, I am not one to like name drop normally, so I just will throw up some of the logos of the bigger brands in New York City that we're working with. Um, you probably recognize a lot of these. And what's interesting is a lot of these haven't made big sustainability claims, um, but because Fab Scrap is something that happens really internally, um, it's been well adopted. Um, and there's a lot of word of mouth to share this as a resource. Part of why I think brands sign up is also just for the information that they get. Every brand that we work with gets a report like this every year where we let them know how much total weight we've picked up, how much weight for that year. Um, their CO2 savings by keeping this material out of landfill and the equivalent trees planted, we're trying to make that extra tweetable and shareable for brands in their CSR reporting. Um, and we try and really give um, the industry in our community, a sense of what we're collecting and what fibers we're seeing in the waste stream. So all of this material, like I said, comes to our warehouse in Brooklyn. Um, we have about 60,000 pounds that we still need to sort. Um, and that's where this volunteer space comes in. Um, like I said, lots of fashion students, we've had corporate groups come through, we've had people have birthday parties as a sorting station. Um, our volunteer Sessions are open, but we've moved the table six feet apart. Everybody is masked and we sanitize in between every session. Um, but people still come to help out and still take home some fabric for free. So these are open again. And it's pretty easy. You don't have to know anything about fabric. Most of what we're sorting is labeled and we're just removing paper staples stickers from the fabric elements. And of course, recycling the paper too. And then, yeah, uh, we work with a shredder in New Jersey. Those small pieces get shredded. Um, we can shred everything except for spandex and leather um, because those aren't 
fibers technically. Leather is a skin and spandex is a rubber additive. So if you take nothing else away from all of this is that watch um, the amount of spandex in your clothing because it makes it less recyclable. Um, we're shredding everything that we can and it becomes insulation, carpet padding, mattress stuffing. It's used quite often in the automotive industry, um, moving blankets. It's now in refrigerated meal boxes um, because more and more people are getting food delivered. So lots of uses to extend the life of those fibers. Um, but the funnest part, I think, is the reuse and the upcycling. Um, so we're saving uh, all of the usable yardage and making that available for shoppers. Any fabric yards that we find in the bag also available. Cones of yarn, leather skins, buttons, zippers. We are saving all of the small swatches with spandex and we sell these as scrap packs. Um, and when I say sell, the spandex is pay what you wish. So lots of free fabric available to students, uh, teachers, other nonprofits. We have an online store, which has really helped us out during the pandemic to redistribute. We used to do pop-up sales at fashion schools. I'm hoping these come back. Um, and then our shop in Manhattan opened in the summer of 2019, which is a true fabric and raw materials thrift store as opposed to buying new. And then we're hoping this process starts over. And like I said, transparency for us is really key. So we put out an annual report every year to help the industry understand how much waste we're collecting, how the community is playing a role in this recycling infrastructure and redistribution, and what is possible by upcycling and using materials saved from landfill as a resource. Um, I think I, I think I made it. <laughs> in the 10 minutes, um, but my contact info is here and my partner Camille um, also there and we're very happy to answer questions. Thank you, Jessica. I think Andy is very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Padian is going to be speaking next on Recycling at Home. He is currently the Director of Multifamily Sustainability at EME Group. Andy, my co-organizer. You all hear me now? I think I'm unmuted. Yes, you're good. We hear you. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about recycling um, at home because I think it's a really good thing to do. Um, I just have to do this thing. OK, so uh, I want to ask the question, are you recycling at home? Um, and if you want to learn about recycling and you don't know how to recycle, and I've already seen questions tonight about what to recycle and where to recycle it, please go to the Department of Sanitation website because they're really good at telling you how to do this stuff very efficiently. Uh, so this is all the stuff that I do. I'm a building scientist. I make buildings more efficient. I'm a community gardener. I'm an environmentalist. I'm a teacher. I'm a mentor. I'm a headhunter. I'm a career coach. Uh, I speak in public all over the country and I do stuff on energy, water and waste efficiency and I'm very passionate about my work and I work in a volunteer for Green Home NYC for the last 16 years, I think. So these two tormentors came by on August 21, 2019 and, it, it, and uh, they were speaking with me at a recycling seminar and Joan Burns Daly was one and Kara speaking after me, so she'll deny all of it. But actually, I will admit that Joan was the major tormentor. And they were talking about recycling and they said, well, we know that it's possible to recycle 77% of one's waste, but nobody really does that. Um, that was actually the evil Joan. And she taunted me before, uh, during and after the recycling forum. So over the next year, I didn't change my practices at all, except I took the time to weigh everything that left my house, like paper and cardboard, like cans and bottles, like compost, non-recyclable garbage, and yeah, like I need another job. So overall, it's pretty easy to do this. I have a hanging bag in the kitchen for cans and bottles and glass and metal. Um, I reduce my household garbage pail size, so you take it out more often so it doesn't stink. I buy less packaged goods and order less delivery and takeout. And that means you need to learn how to cook. 
Um, I organize my cardboard and paper and recycle it on the right days. Um, I think for everybody, it's a good idea to find a local compost site or compost at home and in the office. And just like all of you, I live in a teeny tiny apartment and I don't have room either. So you have to kind of adjust. And this is my Fresh Direct recyclable can bag and it holds about you know a week or two, depending on how much I'm drinking and let's not talk about that, of cans and bottles. Um, I used to put stuff in a beer box, but I find these seltzer bottle boxes and beer boxes that are a bit smaller. If you, if while you're sitting around doing something like I was doing it while I was sitting here tonight, you just rip up your paper and put it in the box. You end up getting about two or three weeks of paper in this box. So it's really effective and it works for me. Um, I'm a composter and in the corner of my community garden, uh, I took this four foot by three foot wide, four foot wide and five foot high piece of chicken wire and I secured it together. Be very careful using chicken wire because it will cut your fingers. And I sunk it about three inches into the soil. Um, at the top of it, I rimmed it with uh, aluminum tape. Um, and then when it fills up and it takes about six, eight months to fill up, you just pick it up and dump it on the garden and then put it back in its little space. And the mice don't like it, the birds don't like it because it's decomposing. Uh, but in my office right here, I have my own one gallon office compost bin. So I compost in the office when I eat a banana or you know have an apple core and I put it in there. And then every Friday I take it home. So nobody in the office yells at me for having stinky compost in my office. So with a few simple practices and a little bit of time and what are your results or my results? Well, here's all the data. Oh, you don't wanna see that data. Okay, let's compose the data. So in total, I throw out 2.16 pounds of stuff per day, but only 19.4% of it is garbage. 23 is compost, 32 is metal and gl glass, and 24, almost 25% is paper. But the large portion of this garbage was caused by me because I'm a photographer, or I was a photographer, I still take pictures, but I was a professional photographer many years ago, and I found that I had boxes and boxes and boxes of photos. So I went to clean them out this year, and I found photos of people I had no idea who they were. It is not possible to uh, recycle photographs or negatives unless you box them and send them to a resource recovery plant. That means a garbage burning plant. So um, I wasn't able to do it. So 20% of all my garbage from that year was just photo waste. So we know it's not possible to recycle 77% of one's waste, but nobody really does that. And I know, I know that because I recycle 80.6% of my waste and you can do it too. So I want to encourage everybody to recycle a little better. And thank you very much. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I definitely have to look at my own waste uh, practices a little bit more closely. Next up, we will have Cara Napolitano, who is the Outreach and Education Coordinator from Sims Municipal, Municipal Recycling. And she'll be walking us through um, recycling practices. Thank you, Karen. Hi, thanks for having me. Good to, good to be back with Brain Home after we tortured Andy last time. Uh, but it seems like it had an impact. So that's, uh, that's really great. And you know, this trash nerd always loves to hear about um, waste characterization studies done <laughs> in the home or for the city. So uh, let me share my screen now that uh, Andy has hopped off. So my name is Karen Napolitano. And as I said, I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for Sims Municipal recycling. This is an aerial of our facility in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. It is a very large facility on the waterfront uh, and this facility is a material recovery facility, also known as a MRF. A MRF is essentially a sorting facility for recyclables. So MRFs, sorting facilities like this exist around the country. But this specific MRF located in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, our job is to receive, sort, and sell New York City's 
residential and public school recycling, uh, which ends up being about a thousand tons of materials each day, which is a lot um, as far as MRFs go. So if you want to learn more about our facility, you should hop on to one of our virtual tours. Uh, hopefully they'll be in person again one day, but for now they are virtual and you get to see inside and really see the inner workings of the MRF. But Today, I, I was kind of asked to talk about the limitations of recycling, and that led me to, to this question. You know, why can't we just recycle everything? Why isn't recycling just the answer to all of our waste problems? Uh, and to answer that question, you just need to know that to be recyclable, something has to fit in the recycling stream. It must be able to travel through the recycling process. So let me show you what that process process is. We're going to start with the consumer. We're all consumers at one point or another. We're familiar with buying something, using it, and then disposing of it. So when we dispose of it, hopefully we can recycle it, at which point it will be collected by our municipality or a hauler or whoever's job it is to pick up our waste. They will then bring our recyclables to a MRF where those recyclables, again, will be sorted into their respective categories. So the MRF then after sorting will sell those items to the appropriate reprocessor. Metals go to a smelter, plastics go to a plastic reclaimer, paper goes to a mill, and so on. So those items can, again, just be prepared to be another product. The next very important step is a brand or manufacturer must buy those items and use them or buy those materials and use them in their products or packaging. And then, of course, sell them back to the consumer. So hopefully the loop can continue. And that's the recycling process, you know, wrapped up like a little present and kind of tied up with a bow. But I'm sure you can imagine there are many potential barriers and challenges that can arise in this process. So to determine if something is truly actually recyclable, because look, anything is technically recyclable, but to determine if something is truly recyclable, you have to ask these four questions to determine if it will successfully flow through this loop. So what are the four questions? So again, we have to get four yeses. And the first question is, the question we're probably the most familiar with, is it accepted in your recycling program? Is there a place that you can recycle it? Maybe in your home bin, that's probably the easiest, or can you, you know, take it to Lower East Side Ecology Center or, or the like to, to recycle or compost it? So is it accepted? And look, you're only gonna get a yes to that question if you get a yes to these next three questions. And now we're really talking about, you know, curbside recyclables, thing that, things that you can recycle in your home. Uh, so will it sort at a MRF or will it get tangled up and cause problems at the MRF? Will it fall through the cracks and be lost in the sorting process at the MRF or will it successfully sort? Is there a market for it? Very important question. Is there a company that wants to buy that stuff and use it in its products or packaging? If not, that stuff is as good as waste. <laughs> And then last, can it actually be reprocessed into something? Is there an existing technology or an existing process to take that thing, break it down and turn it into something new that can be used again? So these are the four questions and I'm gonna dig into each of them just a little bit more in the short time that I have. And remember, we need a yes to all four for something to be truly recyclable. So is it accepted? I, I can't do a presentation without briefly going through what is accepted in New York City's recycling program. So in New York City, we separate our recyclables into two bins. Okay, we have the blue bin and the green bin. In the blue bin, we accept metal, any metal, large or small, glass, bottles and jars only, cartons, they go in the blue bin and rigid or hard plastic. So any plastic that you can set on the counter and it keeps its shape, right? It doesn't deflate. And then in the green bin, we accept paper and cardboard. If you can rip it, you can recycle it in the green bin. Greasy pizza boxes are accepted. Uh, just make sure you take the pizza out of the box, please. And so anything else that's not one of those items is a trash item, unfortunately. We've got chip bags, candy wrappers, single-use plastic bags. You can take those back to certain participating stores to recycle them. Uh, and of course, 
seeing compostables on there, kind of a bummer, kind of a, a soft spot for me and, and some of us. Uh, the city's brown bin program is on pause, but if you can, it, it has been said, if you can take your uh, acceptable compostables, like food scraps to a community garden or a drop off point, if you can compost, compost, compost. But look, if it's not accepted in the recycling program, again, it's because it didn't receive a yes to those other three questions. Question number two, will it sort in a MRF? You know, welcome to the crazy land of the material recovery facility where they have these huge piles of mixed materials, right? That get pushed into this complicated maze of conveyor belts and technology, which is very effective at sorting out certain things, but certain things are very challenging to sort. Like you see at the bottom of your screen, all those plastic bags that we really shouldn't be receiving, but we do receive some, and they can actually get very tangled in our equipment. So at the MRF, we sort things and then we bail them up. But we're only going to be sorting for and then bailing things that have a market. And so New York City is only going to tell you to recycle things that there really is a strong, consistent market for. So things like soft plastics, like plastic bags, there just is not a strong market for these and they get tangled up and cause problems at the MRF. So that's just an example of one material that we really can't be putting in our home recycling bin. So I do encourage you to take them back to stores if you can. So then question four, can it be reprocessed? Look, things like water bottles, they can be chopped into flakes, melted and chopped into pellets, used to make more water bottles or clothing. Cartons, it's that, uh, that soft white paper on the inside that'll probably be used to make toilet paper. Metal cans can be melted down and turned into a variety of metal products and glass bottles and jars can be thrown into a furnace and used to make more glass bottles and jars. Those are fairly simple materials. But some items are more difficult or even impossible to reprocess. Like, sorry, my cat is sitting on my prop, but for example, the chip bag, right? The chip bag is made of many different types of materials. There's plastic, there's metal, there's ink, there's more plastic fused together. Thank you for the time. They're fused together. Very difficult to pull them apart. Costly. It will cost money, it will cost energy. So something like this, that's a bit more multi-layered, more complex, is not really recyclable. It's not going to be recycled. These more complex, multi-layered materials. So those are my four questions to determine if something is truly recyclable. And look, just because we can't recycle everything doesn't mean we should stop recycling. Recycling is good. Recycling is helpful. I want you all to participate in your local recycling program. Just know that that's not enough. It's not a solution in itself. And we must incorporate reduction and reuse. Those are, look, they're on top of recycling in the pyramid. They're more important. Overall, we really need to rethink, there it is, our relationship with materials uh, to effectively you know, manage our waste, cut down on our waste, uh, eliminate our waste, and develop a circular economy. And that's what I have for you today. Please reduce, reuse, and as a last resort, recycle. Check us out online and come to one of our virtual tours. Thank you, Kara. That was wonderful. And thank you to all the speakers. Um, we have been trying to really rush through everybody because we wanted to have a, a, a quick sound bite really from everyone. Um, let me add Yemi back to spotlights. I started going through the Q and A. Unfortunately, Lauren had to leave because she has a, a child she has to put to bed. Um, so she had to leave early. I will forward the questions on to her. I believe the first question that I saw was actually for Yemi, who I'm going to add in. Um, <laughs> Yemi, somebody asked if you use external fertilizer in the aquaponic systems. I do not. <laughs> Um, I, the only thing that we do have to add from time to time is um, iron because there is not enough iron in fish food. Fish don't have a lot of blood, so they don't need um, a lot of iron in their diet. So um, every now and then we do need to add iron uh, for the plants. But other than that, we don't add any fertilizer, just the fish waste. Okay, great. Um... 
There was another question actually for you, Yemi, uh, asking for volunteers to help out at the farm. And I believe you said you're moving in the spring, correct? Yes, we're moving in the spring and we, we will need volunteers. We're just right now working on what a safe and COVID free volunteer system um, is going to look like. Once we have that structure in place, we'll let people know um, we're excited. We're excited to have the new farm set up and to have people um, support us in getting it up and going. We're excited to see the new site as well. Um, question from Paul for Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay, do you think that it's feasible to have different waste management siting policy to address New York City's limited sewage capacity? This question to address sporadic sewage outflow events during rainfall, even small. Yeah, city. yeah. I mean, so pretty near to me, near to my apartment. If you go to the meatpacking district uh, and it's raining, um, you're not just encountering rain; you're encountering sewage. So uh, I understand your question personally. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of infrastructure work that has to go on, particularly in Lower Manhattan, but not exclusively. Um, around um, our whole sewer system and um, upflow and backflow related to that. And I think people aren't very aware uh, necessarily of how many problems we have with that. And I think it's very much connected to the broader resiliency issues we have to tackle um, and the same area that was hit hardest in some ways by, by Sandy. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think it's, it's an important question. And um, this job, if it, the one that I'm interviewing for, is all about land use and zoning and community boards. So it's all about the kinds of investments you make. And I think um, uh, our sanitation system is just as much a critical piece of the infrastructure, which is what I started with uh, in some ways, as anything else. We just aren't as aware of it. Everyone in this conversation is, but uh, so many people aren't. So it's a great, it's a great point. Another question from Donna for you, Lindsay, is what about toxic materials in the sludge, um, in the sludge you would reuse, like pharmaceuticals? Yeah, I saw that. And at the risk of um, being with people like Kara, who are <laughs> more experts in this, this conversation, I, I do know that, um, you know, people, there are a lot of alternatives to pharmaceuticals landing in um, wastewater uh, treatment plants. Um, pharmacies can take them back. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a more complicated question that probably is beyond my scope of experience. If, if someone, someone else wants to answer that or weigh in on it, I'm more of the broader urban planner person, how we, how we, how we respond to these things, but not necessarily an expert on the science itself, knowing that there are ways to do it. Just don't throw out any drugs. That's easy. Yeah. <laughs> Use your drugs or, you know, give them back. <laughs> I think that's a good pharmacy. I believe there is a take back at local pharmacies. Is that correct? And, yes, and he's right. All pharmacies take them. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question that I saw before for um, for Jessica, I believe. I'm trying to find it. Um, wait, before we get to that, Ken Gale asked. Um, you recently heard that plastic waste is being added to asphalt. Is that true? Is it a good solution? And maybe Kara can speak to that and what happens to some of the aggregate. I, I've heard of that happening. That's, I'm not aware of that happening uh, with any of you know, New York City's recycling, but I, I have heard of, uh, of initiatives such as that. Um, more so with us is our, our glass. Some of our recycled glass will be used um, as aggregate and maybe as a filler or um, in other construction projects like as pipe bedding, for example. Actually, if you go onto the Sims website, we have a website just for recycled glass aggregate interested in that and it shows uh, many of the projects that New York City's recycled glass has been used for. Kara, I heard a funny story about Red Sox fans in Massachusetts that put uh, crushed glass in their bike paths um, to make the macadam work better but they didn't crush the glass enough so <laughs> the Red Sox fans got flat tires so it made me happy. Learn. <laughs> Are you a Yankees fan? <laughs> Um, all right, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of um, uh, moves being made right now in reconsidering aggregate to be added to um, cement in order to 
uh, I guess, construct sidewalks and, and mm -hmm. public roadways and, and other uh, construction materials, basically. Uh, another question for you, Kara. We know that supermarkets generate between 23 to 27% revenue by selling purchase behaviors back to FMCGs. I'm not sure what that is. Do you see any opportunities in collecting data sets around waste behaviors, which I, Jessica also does actually? I mean, sure. I honestly, I this is not something that I'm especially familiar with. You know, the data I'm more familiar with is, you know, on uh, on the uh, the bottom end on the on the way on the waste side, not upstream, but more downstream. Um, but you know, that's certainly a way to to think circular. You know, and if sorry, my kitten is loose and she wants to pull down. Um, but it's something to uh, be aware of is extended produce, extended producer responsibility legislation, um, which basically puts the financial responsibility of managing waste back on the producer. So you made it, and then you have to pay into you know pay for it to be disposed of. So. And New York State has a, an EPR bill in the works. I hope it'll pass in the next year, two years. Um, but something like that would require that that sort of a you know circular awareness, not just of you know waste downstream, but upstream as well before it becomes waste when it's manufactured. There was a New York Times article specifically about this, right? Yes, and that mentioned Sims. Um, yeah. Jessica, I actually I know that you said that for your clients, it really helped. Um, to have that data provided to them. And that's kind of the benefits that you, you provide that makes you more of a, it's more of an incentive for people to, to recycle textiles. You wanna to speak to that? Sure. Um, yeah, I think for businesses, one of the hardest things that they have is tracking their waste um, because outside of hazardous waste, most businesses don't have any requirement to report what they're throwing away in what volumes, where it's going. Um, and so for us, it was a way for them to even sort of benchmark how much they were wasting. And so sometimes they'll send us things that they know we can't recycle, like proprietary spandex, which we can't shred and can't reuse, just because they want it measured. And so they, they have a full scope of what their textile waste stream is, and that way they can start to make decisions to reduce that. Um, and so it's really valuable from a corporate perspective to know what you're throwing away because there's potential cost savings there. And if EPR were to eventually come into play, it's good to know what your end of life options are. And that all starts from having more information. Um, a question for Andy or Kara. How, I'm gonna shorten this and, and go with, in other words, how can you incentivize people to change their waste behavior? And this goes a little bit into uh, charging the city charging a fee um, from producers versus consumers. Well, my parents refused to recycle. Uh, I'm sorry, they're both dead now, so I should say nice things about them. But they both refused to recycle, and then all of a sudden, their town gave them a hundred dollar ticket. And then my dad learned how to recycle. Um, in multifamily buildings in New York, you get huge tickets for not recycling properly. So is it huge? Is it huge? Well, the first offense was $25, which... But they go up to 500 For <laughs> a regular offender, they jump really fast. And, and for an owner of a building, $25 is, you know, pigeon feed. But yeah. if, when it hits 500 bucks, it's serious stuff. Hopefully. I mean, to, yeah, to, and to, I would say to change behavior, you know, to, to get people on board, certainly a, a punishment that's an effective, that is effective and actually being enforced can help, but also incentives. You know, like some communities have what's called a pay as you throw system where, you know, you, you might actually pay for the trash that you create, um, but recycling is free. Uh, so just something like that, kind of bringing more attention to how much what and okay, sorry, I live in a zoo, just something bringing more attention to the trash that you're actually creating. Kara, what do you think about the pay, like the kind of pay as you trash method? Because it, you know, in, in some ways, I see it as a very good idea for ending a use, but it also ends up being kind of like the Amazon and fresh direct deliveries, kind of a regressive thing for people who can't afford it, right? Like, how do you, how do you view that? I, I, I think that there is a lot of potential there, but I think in a large city like New York City, it's going to be incredibly challenging to set it up. Um, 
yeah, it, it would be tough yeah. in a large city like this. Um, yeah. I hate to cut people off, but it is eight o'clock. I just want to let everyone know um, we are going to stick around for a little longer if anybody wants to stick around. But before you do, I just want to wrap up um, and share some information regarding our upcoming events. Uh, also, if you're interested in circular economy, um, there's a few different events that are coming up. Um, one is the, I think it's the third annual Circular City Week for New York. And that's going to be March 22nd to the 28th. You can begin registering for some of those events now. Um, another site to check out is the New York, City, New York Circular City Initiative, which is a cross-industry public-private partnership that came out recently. Um, they had a report that they published in the fall, reimagining New York City as a more circular city. So that's a really great report to look up. I will share the links in the, in the chat and I will also be sharing all the resources in a follow-up email. Um, and finally, um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is the leading voice in circular economy. So if you're interested, you should definitely go check out their site. They have some really great resources. And finally, if you're interested, if you've enjoyed your evening with Green Home NYC, here are some of our upcoming events. Uh, February is really focused on the social aspect of sustainability, triple bottom lines of responsibility to people, planet, and profit. Uh, we welcome you to join us and um, hope that you'll consider following us on our social media platforms. It is Green Home NYC for all of them. For those of you who are leaving us for the evening, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and we'll have a follow-up email with all the links and resources.